A pastor and a priest walk into a movie theater. Hi, I'm Father Andrew Miller. And I'm Reverend Michelle Byerly. And this is A Pastor and a Priest Walk Into a Movie Theater, a podcast about faith, life, and the silver screen. And today we'll be discussing the 1974 fantasy film Zardos. And what the hell? That was um, something else for a movie. Um, So for those of you who have not seen it, um, we do recommend checking it out, even just for the bizarre experience of it. If you're offended Um, by nudity, don't check it out. (laughs) Yeah. So um, basically what happens is that we are in a future society where there is this stone headed god that spews out guns on a regular basis and there's this warrior who basically ends up inside the head and he starts exploring and then we learn about this group of people who want to do research on him and then we learn more about the creation of this world that they're in and um there's there's different there, there's a lot um for for being a, a sci-fi kind of movie and for being I, i'm gonna i'm gonna just say b production <laughs> i'm just gonna call yeah. it um that um there's actually quite a bit to the symbolism and to the conversation and so i'm actually kind of excited for today to to dig into this so um I almost want to just start out with as he is waking up inside the head and he's kind of feeling things out. He's trying to explore and there's almost this sense in which he's kind of seeing behind the curtain. He has seen this big, huge head that has dominated life and way of being. And now he's seeing hmm, maybe this doesn't have so much power over my life as I thought it did. Zardoz is a, is a dystopian film. It's a very interesting dystopian film. It takes place 200 years in our future. Uh, yeah, 200 years in our future. Yeah, it's like 2293, I think. Right, so almost 300 years. And it's, it's, it's basically, it, it's interesting because um, as the movie progresses, um this is sort of a shock you find what you find out of uh, where, where all this is coming from is, is it's a kind of shock or at least i was shocked when i went when when i saw him holding the book but i think there's there's no way to really yes. frame the discussion without <laughs> without noting it from the outset that the, spoiler alert yes yeah, spoiler, spoiler alert. alert although if you watch if you listen to this podcast shoot we spoil all our movies anyways the 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 the, the, the book that 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 really sets off sean connery um and 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 it really puts all of this into motion as the wizard of oz in fact zardoz, Daz, is which is zardoz, zardoz oz, oz, right 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 so and 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 what really got me to thinking that you have to say that from the outside is be, is is because going in in inside the head by the way the wizard appears as a head until you find out that he's the guy behind the curtain pay no attention to the man behind the curtain um, and, you, and you even said it. He gets to go behind the curtain. But pay no mm-hmm. attention to the man behind the curtain. And that. So I want to stop right there and throw in a little theology with that. And it comes from the significance of the Holy of Holies mm-hmm. in the temple. Yeah. And even in the tabernacle, as the Israelites were moving from the land of Egypt into freedom and all of that the the present the literal presence of god was there in the holy of holies and it was surrounded by this curtain mm-hmm. that protected it the priest could only go in at that one time a year and offer the atoning sacrifice for the people and in the gospels what happens is that the tur- the curtain gets torn in two and so there's the sense in which there's an interpretation (laughs) that can be made of christianity whereby 
there is something new that is revealed about God, which I don't, I recognize I'm, I'm not framing this well because I don't want to run into supersessionism and um, overriding the history that Judaism brings and still brings. Um, but that's the milieu in which that element comes. And so for me, this, this sense of taking those barriers down supersession is there so go ahead supersessionism by the way is the view that christianity supersedes judaism and and that be therefore the new covenant in christ means that the old covenant in christ is no longer of any value no longer in any effect and and therefore is just basically dead um the the the, the rending of the temple is one of my favorite parts of the gospels because and i and i think that the 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 goal or the, the, how I would read that scene is not that the Holy of Holies is of no value anymore. Um, it's that the Holy of Holies is now open. Correct. That, yeah, right. it's, it's, not, it's no longer contained to the priestly, to just one moment. It's, it's God coming into the world, which is what Christianity believes, that Jesus came and was incarnate love in human form took on flesh all of that the wizard of oz it's interesting one of i knew a lutheran pastor and and i, I it's it's very interesting because this fellow was an elca lutheran uh, not a L missouri senator wisconsin senate lutheran he was you know part of a progressive church and he he he, he had really horrible things to say about the wizard of oz because he found in it a very anti-christian message and it, it was wasn't until i saw this movie that i really i think understood it because at the end of the day pay no attention be, to the man behind the curtain um, in my view, what the climax of the Wizard of Oz is, is you go into the Holy of Holies and find nothing there, or rather you find a charlatan there. You know, you, you, you see the great head, right? The, the great right. icon that you venerate that and, and icon veneration is such a, a key aspect in, of Orthodox Christian theology, but you see the great icon that you venerate. And then when you go behind the icon, behind the, cal the, 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 the curtain of it, you just find a, a fellow, a, 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 an idiot, a charlatan manipulating um, smoke and mirrors, basically. Mm -hmm. And I think that that to me is, is exactly where Zardoz's parallel with the Wizard of Oz comes, comes in, is that, um, uh, Sean Connery breaches the outer court, goes into the the inner court and the Holy of Holies and just finds a charlatan manipulating things. Of course, we later find out that the charlatan Alfred Frayne is very intentional in his charlatanism and is manipulating things for a purpose. That's, I think, another discussion. But the point is, is that and this is where I think we can pull in Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy. You find, in effect, that all of the foundations that you rest your that they that that we've rested our our faith on are in effect useless worthless wrong dead god is dead yeah i was gonna say we have to we have to talk about that in this in this because that is the scene that really struck that for me was when they are destroying all of these statues of greek and roman gods and goddesses i assume i can't say that for sure but that's the feel that i got um you know in that in that image of like there's basically a ransacking of the temple well the friend the, the character friend identifies the statues as gods and says in effect that the gods are dead right and there, there's a line in 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 there that he says oh they're all dead or something like that and take your pick do, do you remember that line i do i some i mean you you've captured i forget the exact words but it's that the other thing i would add that i don't know if we said is and i i think you've brought this up before god is dead but that's not the end of the sentence it goes on and to say have for we him. have killed him exactly yes. you know and so it's it's not just that god is dead from some an outside force or that we have found it, it's that we have destroyed what we knew of god and i think at this point it's important i think to kind of unpack the meaning of the death of god 
um, in, in Nietzsche. But of course, Nietzsche is not the first philosopher to talk about the death of God. Hegel is, I think. Um, Hegel, who was a Christian and remained a Christian to his dying day and was very influential in Karl Marx's thought. But um, what Nietzsche meant um, with the death of God was not that God doesn't exist. Now, Nietzsche didn't believe that God exists, but that's not it. it. It doesn't matter. Nietzsche is not making, Nietzsche is not an atheist in the same way that Bertrand Russell or Richard Dawkins is not an atheist. <laughs> Friedrich Nietzsche is not an atheist in the same way that, say, Bertrand Russell or Richard Dawkins is an atheist. These, the, the, the latter two are atheists because they honestly believe that it is not reasonable to believe in God. Nietzsche doesn't care about reason in, in, in that sense. Nietzsche is an atheist in, the, in, in a far more concrete and religious way. Uh, for, for Nietzsche, atheism is a religion. It is a kind of faith. Um, the death of God represents the end of foundations uh, that humanity has created for itself and projected itself upon. For Nietzsche, the death of God means that those things are no longer necessary for human culture, that humanity has is now gifted. And it, the death of God means that humanity is now um, gifted and it is a joyful thing. The death of God is good news for Nietzsche. Humanity is now gifted with the ability to mature and come into her own. In the absence of the of gods that we create for ourselves, humanity is, is free to really evolve and become its, its truest self. Now, here, here is where I'm going to throw a wrench in certain traditional Christian philosophy. Get ready. <gasps> Throw the wrenches. <laughs> He's right. Nietzsche is absolutely 100% correct. Say it ain't so. And so is Marx when he says that religion is the opiate of the masses. Mm. But here's the thing, though. The God that they're talking about and that they're right, righteously announcing the death of it's not the Christian God. It's a false God. Yes. The God of St. Anselm of Canterbury, that thing greater than which nothing can be thought, right? And Anselm of Canterbury's understanding of, of, of God is that God is that thing greater than which nothing can be thought, right? Mm -hmm. That God is, is false. God, God transcends that. I'm going to pull Karl Barth and say, the true God is holy other. Mm. Right. And so as a result, yes. That, that religion that provides comfort in the face of oppressive capitalism, that religion that provides, um, that, that says, don't worry about social injustice because, and to pull from Zardoz, when you die, you'll get to go to the vortex and live eternally, mm -hmm. right? That religion is the opiate of the masses. But that's hey, and, I wanna, and I wanna continue on that theme because that was another thing that was really interesting. So we end up in the vortex. vortex and what, what kind of blew my mind a little bit was the ending. I mean, it didn't blow my mind in the sense of it made sense, but it was just a, there was a mass slaughter mm -hmm. that the immortals essentially welcomed. Yes. You know, they, they were like, it, it, at that point, it had become a mercy to them to be killed by these um, brutes or whatever they call it, brutals, I think. The is brutals, what they were called. Yeah. yeah, which, by the way, Zed, Sean Connery's character was one, but he was also different. And they were trying to figure out why that was. Because he was engineered by Alfred Frayne to be different. Yeah. As were a number of the brutals, by the way. Go on. Yeah. So, um you know that was that was really interesting to me you know it gets back to we've had conversations about death and dying before on the podcast and it, it's really the theme kind of resurfaces that you know death brings meaning to life absolutely you know the the fact that we don't know our end and so we have to make the most of the moments that we have gives us something to strive for, gives us meaning and purpose and keeps us from becoming apathetic, which is another group, 
you know, so they have kind of these three groups. One is just kind of this, I don't know the names exactly, but they're just kind of immortal eternals. And then there's this group that's become apathetic. So essentially they've lost the will to live and they're, they just can be repositioned and moved, but they don't really do much. And then there's the group that, what do they, what do they call them? Renegades or the renegades. Yeah. And they, and you know, there's kind of this group control where they're forcibly aged. Senile elders who are just basically raging against the machine is how I understand the renegades. Yeah. And, and the character friend who becomes a renegade um, says you essentially have a choice in our society. Eventually it happens to all of us. You become either an apathetic or you become a renegade, pick your right. poison. And that is a very interesting image of hell in my view. Both of those as, as are very interesting images of hell, the sense of, of, of life that just continues ad infinitum, ad nauseum. There's, there's just no end to it. And it's just utter eternal boredom. Yeah. And, and, and if there is an afterlife, in, in a positive sense, it, it must not be that. Like it, it must like heaven in the positive sense is must not be just the continuation of existence ad infinitum. It's it's it 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 it, it would just become so utterly boring that it would become a kind of hell. Right. So um there's a sense in which the vortex reminded me of the Garden of Eden. Hmm. You know, they they it, it it's kind of it. I mean, and and heaven, yes, as well. Which I mean, that's kind of the thing is that Eden was this perfect world. The idea was that they just were there, and then part of the punishment was that Adam and Eve were banished from the garden, and then they were forced to labor on the land and and all that. Which is an interesting. So that's another element here. Mm-hmm. You know that outside the vortex, there's this group of people who basically their job is to labor and to raise enough food Mm -hmm. for the for the if you want to go with marx you know it's the it's the proletariat making it for the bourgeoisie absolutely you know the the productive class versus the ruling class i'm not sure exactly what it is forgive me if i'm not using the right terms here you're You're, you're the the expert (laughs) so (laughs) so um you know and and it's really interesting there's this moment of almost crisis where the people inside are like because of the way that they've structured their society where they can't breed any more people but they're not able to have what they need it's it's there's gonna they create their own crisis Mm -hmm. of scarcity as it were yes and and i see the end as a kind of revolution um although i'm not I, i think it's left open as to the results of the revolution because it it focuses in on sean connery's character and his family life with one of the um former immortals whom he escapes with and mm-hmm. for lack of a better term marries and raises a child with yeah um, yeah that was a really fascinating scene as well where they're kind of in this cave type thing and you just see them first their relationship then her giving birth and then you just watch until finally all that's left of them is bones and even then it zooms in on like the handprint on mm-hmm. the wall you know and, and that was just a really interesting image to end on what that made me think of was Nietzsche's metamorphoses in his work Thus Spec Zarathustra um Nietzsche in that work describes um the transformation of human being of human beings through three stages um the camel the the lion and the child um the camel is the one who studies who learns who is moral um a, a beast of burden is the camel right um at some point the beast of burden realizes that its morality, its submissiveness is, is its own exploitation and rises against it and becomes a, a lion, that, that wrathful lion. Now, and this is very much so 
um, the, the images of the, the beating of the idols, the, the tearing down of the statues is taken directly from Friedrich Nietzsche. And Nietzsche is even directly quoted in the film, uh, talking about dragons yes. becoming dragons. So um, Nietzsche describes um, the lion as philosophizing with a hammer, that society has created all of these idols perhaps they are religions, perhaps they are different, you know, philosophical laws, perhaps they're moralities or, or whatnot. So the lion takes his hammer and starts just beating the crap out of them all and tearing them down. And, 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 and that is very much so the image of that, that we find in the film. And then once, once they're all gone, he synthesizes whatever is left of them. And the, the result is the third stage, the third metamorphosis, which is the child. The child who is free and new and innocent. And by the way, this is how I understand Jesus's discussion of children. Oh. Um, and free and new, experiencing a, a new world. And, and one, who, in one in which, in which the child is free to create their own new um, not idols exactly, but sense of self, sense of meaning, sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. So is that kind of what we observe as he's exploring in the first stages of things? Well, I think we observe a tremendous amount of Sean Connery and the Brutals in the lion stage. Indeed, I think that's where Sean Connery ends up after reading The Wizard of Oz and after taking The Wizard of Oz and the message of The Wizard of Oz to his fellow Brutals and then desiring to to learn the truth of what's behind the corner uh, that's a little bit of camel stage i guess they're trying to find the truth but not just consume the truth but 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 really break it down and destroy it and 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 overcome it and conquer it and i think um the son who um leaves the cave goes out and ventures on his own at the end at the end of the day represents the, 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 the birth of the child self. Okay. But now that all of these, these um, idols are gone, are dead and gone, that the, the child self, the child humanity has the ability to joyfully go out and not con well and experience the world and find purpose and meaning in the world. So. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, uh, is it, I, I wonder, I don't think it's an accident that they're in a cave and he leaves the cave. Because yeah, there's the image of Plato mm -hmm. and, and being so in the dark and all we see is the shadows from the light. And, and then when you leave and go into the world, it's blinding. Well, there's no sense in which, of course, Nietzsche hated Plato. Um, but it's, to be fair, there's no sense in which, and we don't really see the, the child's um, experience. Of course, he's not a child by this time. He's Right. Probably a teenager. Well, and that's, I think it's interesting that we don't. I wish I, mm -hmm. it would have probably made the story longer. And I don't know that it would have necessarily been needed in the story, but it, there is part of me that's like, I, I would have kind of liked to see what happens there. Well, the other thing is, is that there's no real way to see it without defining it. And once you define it, it, it becomes a kind of new camel. Like it's interesting that 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 in order to really the, what what comes after the child is undefined, and I think that's intentional because mm -hmm. the whole point is that the child defines herself, and so in order to really understand the child, you have to be put in the child's place, and 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 subjectively encounter the child as if you were encountering the world anew. And so at that point, um, the only way. That, that, that we could experience what the child leaving the cave experiences is to experience it objectively. In other words, to experience it as if the child were this new camel self taking on, or new lion self, but taking on the world as we see it. Whereas um, by not showing it, the movie kind of invites us to become the child, to leave the movie theater sort of reborn. And, yeah, and, 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 and free to sort of make 
of the world what we will. And I, I see in that a kind of baptism because baptism is a rebirth or a new birth. Mm. And, and, and I also see in that, I mean, Jesus says, suffer the little children to come unto me and do not forbid them for such is the kingdom of heaven. And whoever, not, whoever will, re- will not receive the kingdom of heaven as a child shall not enter therein. And it's interesting that we often think of that we often infantilize the child. We infantilize Jesus's child. We turn him into a camel, right? The one who is who is who is faithful in the naive sense. But if you've ever met a child, you find that children experience the world with such wonder mm-hmm. and such questions. Yeah. And 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 it's it's like to me, what Jesus is inviting us to do is not to become a camel again, is not to um, just have a simplistic it is a simple faith sure but not a simplistic faith where we just accept what we're told carte blanche but rather to go out and experience the world anew as a, 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 a take, take like in, internalize our new birth and our baptism and go out and and experience the the newness of life mm-hmm. definitely um and i was trying to remember if there was a scene this is terrible. I need to go back and watch it again sometime. Uh, was there a scene where he ends up in the river or ends up getting, because like usually when I think of water, I think of baptism. And I was trying to remember if there was a particular baptism moment for him. You know, I don't remember. Yeah. It's I, been a week. It's, mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I've only seen the movie once. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, probably edit that part out. <laughs> no, don't edit that part out. <laughs> No, listener, we we oh, unless you okay if, 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 if we will just you know if, 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 as a credibility if, thing yeah no that's fine we can have a conversation about that <laughs> yeah, okay sure so um so the other thing that I particularly wanted to address was the choice of costuming from a from a particular perspective okay um we're pretty good any more in feminism about critiquing the fact that you know we have princess leia with her skimpy gold bikini and um laura croft who wears really short shorts and chesty shirts we don't often talk about the damage that's done of portrayals of men and this movie i think actually did a good job of I, I think there's a critique to be made here in that regard, How so? you know, um, because to to me, watching the the costumes that the brutals wear mm. <laughs> was was very you know he was very much just, to me there was definitely an objectification that was going on with his character hmm. um, and the outfit that he was wearing and they were trying to study and research him and. And all of that. Mm. Um, and I and I think, you know, we don't often talk about that men can be just as objectified as women can be. And this was a an example of, of seeing that happen. Um and I'm I'm not articulating it very well, but well, I think you are. I I'm, I wonder is it is it related to his nudity? Is it related to his, or is it related more to the fact that he is sort of an object of curiosity for him as a I, brutal? I think both and, mm-hmm. both and, and and here's the other side too. Um, there's also the critique around the archetypes that mm. the movie does challenge. You know, there's this sense in which there's this contrast, this false dualism that's created between the gentleman who kind of, to me, represents the very educated, liberal wussy, so to speak. <laughs> I'm using, um, yes, and then he's like, I think that's. Yes, the one who becomes a renegade? I think so. Because yeah. he starts out um, in, you know, very blonde, very kind mm. of. Um, and, but then you contrast that with the brutal, you know, so men are either you're either kind of this very strong killing guns kind of thing or you're this very educated but not conventionally masculine Mm -hmm. what's interesting is that sean connery's character is almost breaking those 
You know, yes. he's almost he's in this mold of the warrior poet, so to speak. Good, good. You good know, word. he yeah. he's he's the one who, yes, he has this brutality, and there's some sense in which he's trying to make sense of what that has meant for him. Yes, and, and then he gets into this world where he starts seeing mm-hmm. these books and this and this learning and all of that. You know, he's 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 an educated man. Yes, he is. You know, and so he he's kind of saying you can pull from both of these sides. You don't have to be one or the other. As a feminist, that actually really I I am convinced as a feminist that the next conversations that will be had in feminism is actually about how we talk about men. Connery's how we present them. Say what you will about the movie. Sean Connery's character is is very fascinating and very deep. And I think you you hit the nail on the head because he is both uh, a brutal in the sense that he is very violent, although I think he resists the fact that he is very violent, um, as well as someone who is ex- extremely intelligent. And and notice how for about half the film. He convinces not only the uh, immortals, but I think the audience themselves that he's actually just another brutal. He, he, and he does it so subtly that he basically plays stupid. And yet we find later, <laughs> yeah, we, we find out later that actually he's not. He was genetically engineered by Alfred Frain. And there's another interesting piece of the movie, the man behind the curtain manipulating things. Uh, but um uh, 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 he's 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 genetically engineered to be brilliant, and he he's well read and 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 classically ed, for lack of a for, for, uh, inform albeit informally classically educated, and he comes to these people manipulating them in order to think that he's stupid, and yet at the end of the day, and, and, and it's funny how they give him an education by essentially sharing unity with him by essentially like like doing this telepathic thing where they share all of their knowledge with him uh sharing unity coming from a dip from a previous episode on on the television series farscape uh but but even before then he's 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 already well read he's already read every he said i read every book in that library it came easy to me and you know but he's a fascinating character say whatever you will about the rest of the movie yeah. And then he once he reads The Wizard of Oz, he basically destroys it in anger because he realizes the truth. Mm-hmm. And, and, and yet, what do you think about him as a Christ figure? Because he is the Christ figure. Of the movie. You know, I guess I'm I suppose I don't I, I can see it. Um, I. Uh, well, he, he says, I mean, he is designed he is designed to be the one who can help destroy these systems you know that's why alf alfred or, or alfred created him so to speak you know so in that regard yes um i, I don't know what i'm wrestling with is the self the self-sacrificial element and yeah. i'm trying to figure out where i see that it's a different kind of Christ figure but but it, the, where i see it most it's more of a i think a gospel of luke kind of christ figure where christ's death is not this like utterly violent ah, where are you god my god my god where? but more of a stoic um uh, action but in any sense and um, so that act of just sitting in the cave with her mm-hmm. holding well, hands that and but also uh the the he, he saves the apathetics by sharing his body and they even say it. They they spread. They share his body. They 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 start licking him and 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 right. sucking on his body. And it's that that saves them from their apathy. They yeah. they become in that moment a kind of Catholic church, a kind of church that is sort of redeemed through partaking of of his body and blood. Yeah, it's a sacramental moment. Was it was that a a tear or a bead of sweat that they took? It was a tear tear okay i was i was trying to remember and i thought so but you know the sacrifice is not in that he dies but mm-hmm. in that i think he is outcast yeah. like, in that he is he is hunted down by the powers that be by the dragons mm-hmm. yeah. which incidentally do you know the root of the word sacrifice if you break I, it down i do not so sacra is sacred holy mm-hmm. and feis is from the latin to make 
fascia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a, so a sacrifice is to make holy, mm-hmm. you know? And so in that sense, yeah, he, he brings, which is really interesting as we're talking about destroying. So is there a difference between the holy and if, I mean, we're talking false gods here still, but there's, there's something different there. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, I'm not really sure how to how to comment on that. Yeah, just something to think about. Yeah. What, what do you think about Alfred Frame? You know, I really i I like the fact that we start off with him talking directly to the viewer, mm-hmm. and and he poses some really interesting questions. Who made you out of the mud? Yeah. You yeah. know, I thought that was I thought that was a really in powerful question and then and then yeah there's this element of him being the the man behind the curtain it we start with his death so to speak but we know that he's manipulated that by the end of the movie um yeah i mean it it, as, as the one who pulls the strings as the one who you know i suppose he's yeah, I, I'm. I guess I'll say I don't know entirely what to make of him. Well, it's interesting. I and I don't either. But it's interesting that um, he's he, he he's manipulating the situation all along. And I think I I, I see him as as I after read, his death. Yeah, he, I read because him, they try to see his last memories or whatever, and it's basically they can't access them because he can't do that it's interesting that um alfred frain in my uh, reading of the story is, is knows exactly is the character who knows exactly what's going on and knows exactly how it's going to end and it all plays out right down to the very to his very death it all plays out exactly as he planned it and that puts him in in the role of as a, well of a god character but it w- w- what i would say is is two things one um Notice how he says the 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 gun he, and this very opening line of the film: the gun is good, the penis is bad. The gun, <laughs> the gun, yeah. And that's more than just a joke. That's uh, that that is I I uh, that's so the ethos. crucial, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because the, the penis spreads life, mm-hmm. whereas the gun spreads death, and death is good, and life is bad. And it was yeah. all. And the Everything. gun brings mercy at the end in their deaths. Bingo! It, the whole point of it all was yeah. to save his people his he, 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 he i don't think he's a false god i think he's a true god in a certain sense because his whole point was to save his people by freeing them from the suffering of living forever and he succeeded hi father andrew here so with the new gregorian calendar year new faith new media has launched our most ambitious project yet We're starting a crowdfunding campaign over on Indiegogo with the goal of getting our own website where we can have a digital home independent of Facebook and other social media platforms. We'll have the archives of all of our episodes, discussion forums, ways to sign up for mailing lists, and all sorts of other cool stuff. Rewards for donating include line-drawn portraits from Editor Wesley, lifelong membership in the NFNM Minecraft server, and even picking a movie for a pastor and a priest walk into a movie theater and joining us for an episode. If you're at all interested in donating, or even just finding out more, please check out the campaign at uh, bit.ly slash nfnmnd. The link will also be in the show notes. And and, and I, I don't By read the way, the- a suffering they created themselves. Yes. Because and- they were the ones who said, let's figure out this system. Let's create this were this vortex and and all of that and and then they kind of realized maybe that's not such a great thing and he figured it out before they did he figured it out he saw it and not only did that he saw a way out and not only did he see a way out he saw a way out in freeing the brutals his salvation the salvation that he brought to his people was entirely dependent upon the salvation of everyone else in the world whom they were exploiting. He mm-hmm. created this false religion in order that it would be destroyed. And, and my favorite of his lines is, is one of his last ones. He said, ah, it was all a joke anyways. 
I mean, what, what, what wonderful divine humor. Yes. I, 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 and I, I always wonder if, 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 if God is, if, if, if the, the true God is in, in some sense like that, it's like, oh, well, you know, I was always a false God to begin with. Oh, I really exist. And I really created you out of nothing. And I, I really love you, but well, it was always or, a or like in dogma, which I hope we do at some point, but mm -hmm. you know, she kind of asks her, you know, what's the meaning of life? yeah <laughs> you know so told you she was funny <laughs> right uh may he rest in peace <laughs> mm -hmm. anyway so um yeah really really interesting i i, I want to go back to the the gun is <laughs> the gun is good the penis is bad um because <laughs> Because it's it's really an interesting, um, you know. I think there's a a. Uh, I don't know if it's intended to be a little bit of a political critique there, but but it's almost like we we worship the gun, we 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 make it a, an idol and a and a thing. Um, For one of our comedy nights, we're gonna do George Carlin's, uh, one of George Carlin's stand-ups. I don't know if we'll do this one, but George Carlin has this wonderful take on war. Like mm. George Carlin talks about war. Notice how all the bombs and shells are shaped like dicks. <laughs> Notice how the guns are shaped like dicks. It's a subconscious need to project the penis into foreign affairs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is which is really funny because then you know we have the penis is bad so you have these two seemingly contradictory statements to mm -hmm. each other that yeah. somehow get brought together so. yeah i i yeah i i um uh, the way i read penis is bad is because the penis spreads life and spreads ultimately life. it's coming from from a person who just desperately wants to die to be done with his boredom oh by the way I'm going to challenge something that I said. I said that um, um, that that Sean Connery's character Zed was the Christ figure, the savior figure. I don't think he was. I think Frain was the Christ figure, and he actually died. He died so that life could be freed from this dystopia that that his people created. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So. Um... Oh, um, there's the there's the line in there where he asks for truth, and she says the truth burns. You can't handle the truth. You know, another um, film we ought to do. Yeah, um, and then and then I uh, the destroying we've talked a little bit about destroying the tabernacle itself you know they even use the term tabernacle mm -hmm. which the tabernacle even in today's tradition is where the post is held mm -hmm. um in the roman catholic tradition and others as well mm -hmm. another so okay what did you make about their whole process of well let's have a vote on this let's vote let's vote <laughs> You know, and yet for being a quote unquote democratic society, it didn't feel democratic at all. Well, what's interesting is I, I, I think we coming out of liberal democracies expect democracies to be liberal um, in the sense that they're also you know, libertarian, that you know, democracy promotes liberty and, and, and freedom and that sort of thing. Well, actually, um, there have been a number of philosophers like say Chantal Mouffe is a Marxist philosopher, uh, well, post-Marxist philosopher, um, uh, among others who have, who have said that there is an inherent tension between freedom and democracy because democracy is the people asserting their will. That's totalitarian potentially. Whereas freedom, liberty is the freedom of the individual to be the individual, which is anti-democratic because it's not the rule of the demos, the masses, it's, it's the rule of the individual. And so it's very interesting. Liberal democracy is so fascinating in that we take these two contradictory notions and we synthesize them. And what I thought was is that, that their society was democratic in the truest sense of the term, that, that it really did rely on true and direct democracy, but it was totalitarian in the sense that it was, well, it was a totalitarian democracy. And 
I, I think Oceania in 1984 could be called a totalitarian democracy. Anyway. Yeah. And, and to say that democracy in and of itself is not an inherently quote unquote good system. Yes, which is Platonic, although Nietzsche hated Plato, but Nietzsche also hated democracy as well. Um, and um, it, it really is that sense of democracy that prevents the arising of the Ubermensch, um, the, the child self, well, the, 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 that which transcends humanity. Now, I'm not sure that Nietzsche is right about that. In fact, I actually rather like the synthesis of liberty and democracy. Uh, I, I, I think I like them both, and I think they're both ultimately good things. Um, but, but the critique of democracy, I think, that's in this film is, is very, very poignant. Um, and for, for all the fact that it is a Nietzschean film, I think also resonates with Plato's critique of democracy and the Republic that um, the democracy constitutes the demos ruling and the, the demos are, are you know, the masses, which is another interesting thing because the, the, if there's anybody who are the, like the philosopher kings in Plato's Republic, it's the very people who are the demos, the people who are ruling, which are you know, the, the, the immortals. So, and of course the, the rest of the demos, they're, they're running and hiding from brutals, so. Which probably suggests that my entire analysis there on democracy might have been bullshit. Don't edit that out, Wesley. I, that was that. I want to keep that, <laughs> that, that bullshit in. Um, but no, uh, the the yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I I'm curious about what you think about um, edit this part out, Wesley. May. Not May. Maricela, is that right? Hang on, let me look. Consuela. Consuela, there it is. Yeah. What did you think of Consuela's character? Because it turns out she, and, and it seems that there's a, there's a resistance movement among the immortals, like from the very beginning, that Friend's a part of, that Fran's a part of, that um, Consuela's a part of. What did you think of the character of Consuela? Um, it, it, I have to confess, I kind of struggled to keep track of all the different characters mm. sometimes. And um, I mean, in the sense of, I... <laughs> Well, she's the one who says truth burns. Yeah. I thought of her as a prophet. Yeah. Because that's what well, a prophet and, is. And then they, she kind of, they kind of discovered that she was sharing information with him. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think you're right. A prophet's probably about the best. You know, she was the one. I, I was trying to remember if she was the one who was trying to kind of say, you know, he's still a what what benefit do we have from just studying him and studying him no she was the one who wanted to keep him alive and uh, to ostensibly study to study him but in reality okay. Okay. um what i think you discover about consuela is is that she's in on it to, to begin with that she she actually is like friend sort of wanting to destroy the 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 this this society that they built um and and i think that um um she uh because she is the one who shares the truth with him and 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 she, well as well as receiving the truth of where he comes from um so but i i i read her as a prophet but more than that um i also thought that may was interesting because and i didn't really get this in the first viewing of the film because on the one hand she kind of she's the most militantly anti zed of all of them and she's the one who goes off on this 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 rampage looking for Zed to extricate him from their society and yet she's also the one who in the end the only one of, who stays with him who who yeah who who survives mm -hmm. and yeah um and and I think that that, that that's the key to that that Nietzsche the, the the one place in the the story where they actually quote Nietzsche directly that that you to 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 when you go out and seek to destroy dragons you become a dragon that mm -hmm. it's it's her it's her becoming, he, he, she becomes him and she becomes, because, and he is the lion self in, 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 in the court. He, he's the one who's trying to destroy all these idols and in, in order to uncover the truth. And, and in her quest to destroy the one who perverts, who destroys the idols in order to save the idols, she ends up destroying the idols herself. And, and it's her followers who end up being the ones to smash the statues. So. Mm -hmm. So, 
I want to jump back to a different topic, uh, but it relates. You talk about idolatry, and that seemed to be a theme that kind of came out for me. And I thought about the the masks mm. and of the heads that the brutals wore. And and I I think at the end don't they pretty much destroy them? No, or, they don't. No, they don't. Yeah, that's, so that's so interesting. interesting too. Yeah. Yeah. But but I think about that image of using religion as a mask in some sense i don't know if that's what's intended but i just am thinking about that (laughs) yes um the um spiritual bypassing is a term i feel like um nietzsche when nietzsche says god is dead or what i understand to be idolatry is that god which nietzsche says is dead the, the, the it's it's the god that we create for ourselves right it, it's yeah. the god that we and and there's a um ludwig feuerbach is a german philosopher who who was an atheist who argues that what, what christianity and, and marx is very heavily influenced by this what christianity is is um taking the best of human nature and projecting it onto a non-existent entity and then worshiping that non-existent entity right now i i think he's right in that that is just an idol and that that is that doesn't really that projection doesn't really exist oh by the way that's not god that's not the christian god that's that's not what god is god is not the best of humanity right god is beyond humanity god dares to take upon god's self humanity but god is beyond humanity um what, what I think of idolatry is that idolatry is the creating of false gods or the creating of, of foundations by which to rule our lives and then imposing those foundations on others. Correct. Right. But, but what's so interesting is, is that, because of course, Alfred Frayn does that with Zardoz, but the film has a, has a wonderful way of defying simple narratives because yes, idolatry is bad but alfred frayne's idolatry is the means by which liberation is attained yeah that's a really interesting point (laughs) but yes (laughs) the other thing it makes me think of is the concept in eastern orthodox theology and i'm very heavily influenced by eastern orthodox theology of iconography because the icons are not just pretty pictures that you find in a church um, icons are called in the Orthodox tradition windows to heaven. And right. there really is a spiritual sense in which venerating an icon you know, it, it is the way in which um, one's worship passes to, to the prototype that is behind the icon. Yeah. There is a very, very... And a, and a critique of the iconoclasts, the icon breakers, mm-hmm. is that it still ends up leading to idolatry. Yes, Yes, but on the other hand, it's like, on the one hand, I, I see this tension in my thought, in my analysis of the movie, of the positive use of the icon, which I think is represented in the tearing up of the, the, the curtain in the temple, mm-hmm. uh, which, because the, the curtain in the temple is an icon. In fact, it's, it, it, it has iconography on it. It has um, a, a seraphim on it, right? It literally has icons on it. Um, and yet, when it is torn open, I don't read that as a bad thing. I don't read that as the desecration of the temple. I read that as a, as a sacralization of the temple. The tearing open of the veil is the revelation that there's something behind this icon and yeah. it is holy and it is wonderful and it is good. And yeah. you look into the Holy of Holies and you will see the living God ascending and descending. You will see the son of man ascending and ascending. And it is for you, the people, to see. It's not for some priestly class. It's for you, oh believer, to see. That's the point of the tearing up of the icon. It's not that the icon is bad. The icon is good. But there's something behind the icon, too. Now, mm-hmm. um, the icon of Zardoz's head is sort of the anti, the reverse of that, that there's nothing behind this icon. Nothing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's empty. It's just a man behind the curtain. Dare I say an empty tomb ah how interesting (laughs) 
So again, we're subverting the narrative. Yes, the the, the Zardos, I think that like like really really um um breaks the idea of simple narrative. That like you really really mm. it creates narratives on narratives, which is something that Nietzsche, as a philosopher, loves to do. Yeah. So if you were preaching a sermon on this, what would the takeaway be for the congregation? Oh, by the way, I would love to see you try to show this 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 to your congregation. <laughs> Love it. I would. I would be very interested to see with what uh, uh, what the conservative folks from uh, from Nebraska make of all of the 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 nudity. Oh, by the way, I was going to ask you about the female nudity too. What you thought hmm. about that? Well, I mean, it was definitely there, but I mean, I I'm, I'm trying to. I when I when I think right down to it, there wasn't. I mean, the, the women were honestly more covered than the brutals. <laughs> well, yeah, they were less sexualized. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's a, again, it's, a, it, I think there's a critique that's, that the movie is making or not making there about objectification, sexualization. Um, I, I want, I did want to talk about this. Um, so I don't know if we've mentioned the Bechdel test before. Mm-hmm which is two fe- two named female characters that talk to each other about something other than men. And I'm, I was trying to decide if this met that because it does kind of seem like a lot of the conversations are about Zardos or about Zed, excuse me, but not necessarily. I think there were some broader conversations about the future of the the vortex as a whole and so for for a 1970s movie to pass the bechtel test is actually doing pretty good yeah i'd have to go back through it and well of course i i, I shouldn't be the one to decide but uh i i, I also think you know and going back to the issue of of nudity i mean for for mm-hmm. me I, I found it very interesting that the the male nudity was very sexualized. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, you have this yeah. hunk in Sean Connery, but and the, the female nudity was not. Why yeah. is it that men get to go about shirtless in our society, but women don't? Why is it that the woman's breast is considered this thing, this holy of holies that you, that you really can't ought not mm-hmm. see? But no. men. <laughs> well, and but what's interesting is that some of that's actually cultural because there are some cultures in which for a woman to cover her breasts mm-hmm. is actually like they're women of industry who yes. <laughs> they have to pay to see. They're considered prostitutes if you cover yeah. your breasts. Right. And and and, and I'm noticing my own discomfort about talking about this again. <laughs> So we're, we're just continuing on with our themes from <laughs> um, Jenny, Jenny Slate's conversation, but, but it's interesting. It is. I, it, so I, I actually did look to see who the director was on this and it's a male director, mm-hmm. which is really interesting because this movie didn't feel quite as male gaze you know, we talk about the male gaze mm-hmm. and 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 looking at the aesthetic of of men and and what's pleasing to them and and all of that. You know, it, it really actually felt a little bit more of a female gaze. So much of what's driving the conflict in the vortex is the conflict between two women, mm-hmm. which is why and they are the political powerhouses. Which is why even if all they ever talk about is Zed, there's a sense in which perhaps they still pass the Bechdel test because they're ta- in talking about Zed, they're talking about, I mean, it, it, Zed is really just kind of a, you know, it happens He's to be a MacGuffin. Zed, but, but, but they're talking really about the future of their society. They're talking about, yeah, Zed's the MacGuffin that, that enables them to really carry forward this deeper conversation about what the future of, the, of their society looks like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay, back to the question of preaching. <laughs> yeah, sorry about uh, that. No, I think, I think I would probably have to talk about the idolatry, the Holy of Holies element. You know, what, what do you do when you have a moment where you get a glimpse behind the veil and you don't know what to do with it? You know, because I think there are some times where people have crises of faith because 
the thing that they thought they knew, the thing that had been presented to them, they see behind the scenes of it and they realize, ooh, maybe this isn't so, this isn't what I thought it was. And, 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 you know, okay, so how do you, we talked in seminary that sometimes the process of seminary is deconstructing all of that idol so that then we can reconstruct a solid theology. There's something that is often repeated in the later seasons of Battlestar Galactica, which we also should do, mm -hmm. um, to know the face of, it's a Cylon saying, because in Battlestar Galactica, the Cylons, the robots are monotheists. Um, but the Cylons say, to know the face of God is to know madness. I love mm -hmm. that. I Which, I mean, that's one the tradition holds that to view the face of God, you would die. Some argue literally go mad. <laughs> yeah. You know? to, to, to look beyond the veil, to look, look into the true beatific vision. I, I, I've wondered if honestly one of two things would happen. One, you'd see nothing because it's undefinable. It's undefined. You just would see just nothing. Yeah. Um, true nothingness and the other thing is is I, I wonder if you would see just what whatever whatever you'd see it would dr just drive you mad mm -hmm. probably to the point of death of course perhaps both are true because yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and and, and what's, what's interesting is is um I, I suppose I would talk you know it's the very first sermon I ever preached was in a Christian church disciples of Christ I was in college and I was very very obsessed with Friedrich Nietzsche and so I gave a sermon on the death of God. And that was the very first sermon I ever preached. Interesting. <laughs> yes. And my point was, is that God, the God we create, is dead and good riddance. Mm -hmm. And that frees us to be able to go out as the child self and yeah. encounter the true God, who is holy other. So. Um. It's interesting in the um, in Dan Brown's book Origins, he quotes Blake. I think it's Henry, not Henry Blake. Um, great poet and uh, also artist wrote. Um, he's known for like Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bride in the Forest of the Night. But I don't know either. <laughs> yeah, and but I think it's William Blake. But one of the quotes is basically, and it becomes kind of a, a key for the plot of that story, where, where the dark religions are departed and sweet science reigns. Mm. You know, and, and in some level, it's the argument that, you know, are we just destroying religion in the name of science? And, you know, the book talks about the God of the gaps and what happens when we find out more and that takes, does that take away from God? And ultimately, the solution that the book comes to is kind of what we've been talking about, that, you know, there is this false sense of God that's been created, and maybe we are seeing the death of God. One of the things that Wesley, that one of the ways in which Wesley described New Faith, New Media that I love, I, I absolutely love it, I found it like just utterly inspiring, is that um, we have this great fear as a society that as we move forward, there's less spirituality. There's more. There's Correct. more spirituality. There's more out there to make meaning of from a theological and religious perspective. There's not less. And 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 to me, it's like when we when we are able to 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 take the hammer of theology and philosophy and tear down the idols, tear down that god of the gap, uh, Mr. Bart tear down this idol sorry i couldn't help but do reagan anyway <laughs> uh but no when, when we take the hammer of philosophy and theology and tear them down we find that the death of the god of the gaps opens up whole new worlds of faith it doesn't destroy faith it 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 it, it resurrects it it turns faith into a phoenix and it's joyful that's why the death of god is such a joyful thing it, it, Nietzsche proclaims it as a joy and you know, Nietzsche wasn't a Christian but I think he could have been 
And 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 I think that the death of of the God that he was talking about dying is perfectly compatible with Orthodox Christianity because the, the God of Orthodox Christianity is not something that you can define using idols. So mm-hmm. yeah. So what's next? Right. Well, we are, I believe we're moving into our hiatus here. We are. And so um, hang in there with us, folks. We will let you know when we're coming back together as we enter into this holiday season and we have some really exciting movies and conversations in store. Um, But we most of all just want to thank you for joining us in these conversations today as we peek behind the veil of these movies and we try to take that hammer of theology and break them down together. So if you have liked what you've heard, we ask that you like, comment, share, subscribe through all of the social medias and join our other podcasts, Faith in What Resonates, Faith in the Dice, Breaking Fast with St. Sparkle Bear, and all of these other things as we release them and, and share all of these ways that we are trying to make meaning of this world. So you can do it that way. And, you know, doing this stuff takes resources. It takes money. And one of the ways that you can support what we do is by becoming a patron through our patreon at patreon.com slash nfnm where you can join us for a monthly level um, of what you're able to give and that will give you access to the blessed lunatics comedy roundtable that we do monthly we just recorded our october one yesterday and let me tell you it was a hoot and also dealt with some interesting (laughs) some deep conversations like the end of the world so um, we ask that you join us in that way there's other ways that we will be continuing to expand our mission and our reach over the next months to year and so we just invite you to keep abreast of all of those things we want to thank our editor wesley morrison sloat for his work to make us actually sound reasonably intelligent among Mm -hmm. one another we thank gail gallagher for her musical work for us and for that little bit of cheer that she provides in that regard and for everyone who has been listeners and supporters of all that we do we are so grateful and we will look forward to joining you again the next time a pastor and a priest walk into a movie theater we walk into a movie theater for zardoz all hail as of the 10th of january new faith new media's indiegogo campaign is 13 percent funded with $65 of our $300 goal. Thank you very much to Al Cole, Wesley Morrison Sloat, and Gail Gallagher for their donations.